I've just finished my first test print with this new Secit Go. This is meant to be the machine that you upgrade to once you've learnt the ropes in 3D printing. So is it good enough to live up to that claim? I have here in front of me all of the components for a kit 3D printer and it's called the Secit Go. All I've done up to this point was to remove everything from the box and peel off all of the protective plastic film. This is a 3D printer kit that I'm really excited about. So to explain why, let's start by looking at the specs. Secit is a new 3D printer manufacturer from Taiwan. And I think this phrase says it all. This is your second Core XY 3D printer kit. This is not aimed at beginners, rather an overkill platform for reliable productivity. Secit's first 3D printer was the SK300 or 600, which refers to the height of the build volume. But the printer we're building today is the SK Go. The SK Go and the slightly smaller SK Mini are built on 2020 extrusion. We can see the Mini matches the size of an Ender 3, and the Go matches the size of a CR10, but not quite as tall on the Z. One thing that I really like is you can pick your parameters to make the price higher or lower. For instance, we can change our size. If we want to save some money, we can self-source our own aluminium extrusions, and the list goes on and on. The configuration of the unit in this video is shown on screen now. Please pause it to see in more detail. Hopefully you agree the specs are incredible. The base price for the Go in this video is 550 US dollars. Now at the moment there is a promotion where it's US $100 off and that makes the price of this competitive against any reputable large format 3D printer. What makes me excited about this printer is it's got a lot of the features that I would add to an existing printer as aftermarket modifications. There's still scope to modify it further to my liking, but the base spec is very desirable. Now for this guide, I'm going to be following the online instructions and they might get updated after what I present here. So make sure you check what's online if you're building your own kit and follow the most up-to-date version. From what I've seen so far, they look to be excellent instructions. Really clear diagrams, well-worded English, and even a little bit of humor as well. One other thing that I really like is how well everything is labeled as well as a packing list. Even things like all of the nuts and bolts have a specific label to help you locate them easily. Now, if you are building one of these printers in the future and you get stuck, probably best to contact the support that's on the manual. Anyway, let's jump straight into it. And it looks like the first chapter where I actually put things together myself is chapter five. So that's where I'll be beginning. This first section was simply preparation of some joining parts for later on. That meant putting an M4 bolt with an M4 lock nut at the base. In the instructions, it's time to assemble the left frame. One thing I really like is I've got this little jig here to get the spacing right. So you line this up with components as you screw them in and that will ensure everything's in the correct place. These early steps were really straightforward and you can see that the base piece is not on the ground and that assembly piece comes in handy at getting the exact spacing, much easier than measuring. After this, we build the right hand frame and that's almost symmetrical apart from the power plug in the corner. Next up, we join the two halves together and you can see the instructions call for the frame to be propped up. I found the stepper motors for X and Y were the exact height I needed to get everything parallel with the table. After this, the cross beams and the back plate go into place. I've just finished putting the main frame together. I've made sure it's sitting flat on the ground and then I've tightened everything so far because I'm happy that it's square and it's sitting really nicely on the table. So far, it reminds me a little bit of the X3D tool change printer in the way that the frame is set up. I think there's more CNC components on that, so therefore it's a lot more expensive, but they claim best of the best. This one, a little bit more budget oriented, but I'd have to say it feels solid as a rock so far. My next step is to put the front in place. You can still see there's a little bit of flex there, but that will be fixed once we put the next components in place. The front panel is pretty straightforward. You simply put on the 3D printed enclosure for the back, and then it gets wedged in between two extrusions across the front of the printer. The next part of the frame is for the Z axis. There's an additional vertical piece on each side and then a cross brace horizontally across the middle of the printer. By this stage, the frame was getting super stiff. We then have four bits of extrusion left and we put those together into a rectangle for the heated bed. And then we're using the first of the bespoke metal parts that control the motion system. These are really, really high quality. I've just finished installing the linear rails for the Y axis and have to confess I got really confused over something and I might explain it in case it can help someone else. So it talked about end stops and I assumed it meant end switches that we use 
as end stops, but instead it was talking about these bolts that go either end and they stop the carriage on the linear rail from coming off and all of the ball bearings escaping. So now that I've got my head around that, I can continue with the build. The belt system for a Core XY printer is a lot more complicated than for Cartesian, therefore we have a lot of idlers that we need to assemble and fortunately the diagrams are really clear. The stepper motors are used to tension each of the belts and they slide back and forth on the frame with a bolt to hold them in place. It's a really simple system but it seems to work extremely well. Next up is the X axis and it has a nice machined piece that goes across to the middle of the printer. There's another set of idler pulleys that complete the elaborate belt system and around this time I followed the instructions to move everything back and forth before tightening to make sure everything was parallel and smooth. Now it was time to insert the beefier linear rails for the Z axis. We use that same 3D printed part to aid with the alignment, it really is very valuable. Like the motion system on top, I spent a fair amount of time moving everything back and down to get it to self align before tightening up the bolts. I next lowered everything down to the bottom and attached the continuous loop belt for the Z axis. We continue with the bed assembly and I followed the advice of the manual to use a round object to help roll on the silicon heated pad. Now this is where I encountered my major problem with the assembly and that's that one of the holes do not line up with the holes on the heated bed. Overcoming this was simply a matter of drilling a single hole. I've passed on my problem and hopefully it gets fixed in future. The final step is mounting this subframe to the mainframe. So the bed is on and I can manually move the belt to get it to go up and down. The leveling system is also in place and I'm probably going to have to adjust this bed mount later on because it can slide to the side, angle, whatever you need to to get it to line up. Next step seems to be make or break and that's inserting all of the belts up the top and putting on the mount on the end of this linear block which is just masking taped in place at the moment. So after the next step, all of this top motion system will be complete. This was my favourite part of the whole assembly. These parts are a press fit and you put them either side and do up the bolt and they slowly squeeze together perfectly. After this it's time to tackle the core XY belts and let me say it's not for the faint hearted. If you take the time and study the diagrams closely you'll be able to put it together and get it working. Next in the manual is electronics and then tuning. There's no section for the extruder and that's probably because you can choose which extruder you get. This one has a direct drive. So I'm just going to follow my nose and use my experience from other 3D printers to get this one together and then I'll proceed to wiring. The extruder as tested in my kit is from Triangle Labs and it's a clone of a Bontech BMG. This extruder is capable of being mounted in direct drive or Bowden tube and for this printer it stays as direct drive. The hot end is also from Triangle Labs and it's a clone of an E3D V6, something I've fortunately assembled a few times in the past. If you haven't done this and you get stuck, you can always consult the documentation from Triangle Labs online. Onto the wiring, and all of the electronics is held on the back panel. The back panel is not plain acrylic, it's actually aluminium composite material. There's pre-machined holes here for all of the electronic components that come with this kit, and I note that there's also a mounting pattern for a duet board as well. The wiring diagrams for the heated bed as well as where to plug everything into the main board are very clear. The version of the manual I used wasn't very clear on which way to route the wires. After a bit of trial and error however, I managed to find a really efficient way. I found some of the wires were a little bit too short and other ones were a fair bit too long, so I'll have to do some tidying up at a later date. So that's it, that's the assembly finished apart from one thing. We've got this fan shroud here and I've got a part cooling fan wired up but dangling here. It's still on the support material and rough, so I guess I better break that off and work out where it goes on. Not covered in the instructions, but hopefully straightforward. It actually makes a lot of sense to ship this with the support material still on, because it's a delicate part and this should guarantee that it arrives in one piece and without any damage. Well, I've got the thing together. Time to turn it on for the first time and test that everything works. Now this does have sensorless homing. You can see the X hasn't worked there. And the Z has, but we've got a bit of a problem. We've got probably an inch gap between the tip of the nozzle and the bed. So the bracket is currently in the way. I'm gonna to have to switch sides for that and move it up. Let's test some heating. Okay, preheating PLA. Well, that's happening. Let's come back to our fan. Yep, I can hear and feel that that's working. 
So that really noisy fan is the one for the heat sink on the hot end. Sounds almost too noisy, almost like it's a 12 volt fan getting 24 volts. You're gonna have to check that one. Uh, we can see the bed's already up to 42 degrees. Hot end's already up to 120. Everything appears to be working there. Probably need to tune the sensitivity of the sensorless homing for the X axis. A little bit of tweaking before I can do my first print, but I'm gonna save that until tomorrow. So it's been a day or so and I have the machine back and I spent yesterday just making some little upgrades for it. One of the nice things about this machine is it's designed to be customized. All around the machine, you'll find spare holes and mounting locations to make custom parts. My main problem with this printer was the Z end stop assembly. The printed plastic part that comes with it is meant to be a press fit, but for me, it just wasn't tight enough. Therefore, I designed this really simple solution where the micro switch is bolted to the frame above the Z axis on the right hand side. And then a long M3 bolt goes through a custom part and I can adjust it up and down to tune my starting height. On the opposite side, I've got this simple part to hold the filament runout sensor, as well as take a Bowden tube that feeds to the extruder. But remember, this is direct drive. So this is a reverse Bowden and you don't need to spend money on expensive tube or anything like that. On the back of the extruder and the back of the frame, I've got two simple pieces and they're designed to take another spare piece of PTFE tube just as a cable guide. And then I've got a spiral up around that. The head can now move around to wherever it wants and the cables will stay upright and out of the way. Finally, on Thingiverse, I found these little 2020 extrusion cable clips. I've got about a dozen and a half of those spread around the machine, just holding the wiring close against the frame and keeping things a little bit tidier. There's still a little bit to tidy up on the back, but overall, I'm pretty happy with how this thing looks at the moment. So probably what you really want to know is how well does it print? Well, I've got three test prints, but they're very telling. The first is a very simple 20 millimeter calibration cube. And I did this before doing any of the calibration steps outlined in the manual. For the very first print, this thing still looks damn good. But then after this, I spent a little bit of time tuning linear advanced and I printed another cube and guess what? That one looks even better. When we compare the two, we can see that there was a tiny bit of ringing on the first one evident next to the letters. By dialing in linear advanced in Marlin, we can see that that's all but been eliminated. This was a really worthwhile use of my time and I'll probably make a video about tuning that in the future. Now on the Facebook page for this printer, they had some pictures of some really outstanding benches. So I was keen to see if I could emulate those results. And I'm proud to say that I did. I started with my Sidewinder X1 Simplify 3D profile, put the base speed down to 60 millimeters per second and the layer height to 0.2 millimeters. I reckon this might be the best ready benchy that I've ever printed. It's got excellent cooling on the underside. There's no surface artifacts on the side of the cabin. There's no stringing. All of the letters are formed really nicely and ringing is very, very faint. So onto my final summary. Yes, there were some teething issues with this and I'd call them exactly that. I'm pretty sure this might be the first SKGO kit sent out. And that means that not many people have been through the instructions to give feedback. The good news is that all of the things that I mentioned were implemented within 24 hours and updated for everyone else to see. Also, the little upgrade parts that I printed, I'll have those publicly available so anyone else can benefit from them if they think they're gonna be of use. After one day of tinkering, based on print quality results, I'd have to say this is already my best 3D printer. Is it the right printer for you? Well, it's definitely still not for beginners. There's a lot of assembly there. You might manage it if you're confident and as we know, this printer is designed for someone who's already got their first 3D printer. I think in the very near future, this thing will be refined based on mine and other initial customers' feedback, and then it should be a very polished machine for the price. Yes, I needed to do a few little printed parts to optimize the printer, but the base hardware is amazing. The quality of this Benchy proves that the motion system is top notch. Of course, I'll be using this extensively as part of my review period and releasing that video in the future. Make sure you don't miss it, hit that sub button. If you have any thoughts on this printer and how it compares to some other large format printers such as the CR10S Pro, the BQ Thunder, and the Sidewinder X1, all of which I recently compared, please leave them below in the comments. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.